how do I negotiate all of those different ties? Honor them all. I think it's wonderful. I have German, Swiss, Scottish, Lithuanian, and a bit of Russian. By adoption, I have Taino and Arawak. So, honor them all. Okay. I mean, the dead will guide this. There are usually one or two ancestors that will come forward to inspire you and to kind of keep everything in order. It's not about where your ancestors come from. Everybody has ancestors. If you go far enough back, we share common ancestry. It's about engaging. I mean, you can pick up ancestors that aren't related to you by blood. They can be powerful mentors or teachers. They too can be included in your ancestral house friends that may have died. Um, it's, it's not about where your ancestors come from. This idea of racial purity is horse shit. Absolute horse shit. It's a disease of the modern mind that also gave us nationalism, colonialism, and a plethora of other ills doesn't matter. Everybody has dead. Just honor them. And yes, it's true that in certain lines, well, maybe a particular family of ancestors will speak more strongly to you. That's fine. Let your ancestors guide that practice and eventually you'll get yourself sorted out. I think it's wonderful that we have people that can, draw, can honor and draw on so many different communities. Some of us, like myself, are growing up you know, in the Midwest, with very little connection to anything, what are some just what are some baby steps I can do? I'm going to answer that in a minute, but I want to speak first to those who might be adopted because it just occurred yes. to me that some people might be watching this and thinking, "Well, I'm adopted. Great. That means you have four lines that you can honor. Adopted ancestors are just as strong and just as important as your biological lines." My strongest ancestor is my adopted mom. So you have four lines that you can honor, so get to it. Um, to answer your question, I would first start by setting up a small altar or shrine. This doesn't have to be huge. It can be a windowsill if that's all you have. I know people who get really creative with this. I've seen people have reliquary boxes, like little pretty boxes that they kept pictures in a little bowl in and when they wanted to engage with their ancestors. They opened it up, they displayed the pictures, they lit a candle, they made their offerings. Um, if that's all you, the room you have, that's fine. Um, me, you see part of my ancestor altar behind me. Uh, this is for my adopted mom. I have a larger altar in my dining room, which is where they seem to want to be centered. And that has a shelf above it and a huge credenza, and there are pictures of my dead displayed, um, various items from the lands that they ha from which they hail, offering bowls, offering glasses, all sorts of things. Dedicate a space to your dead. It doesn't have to be that elaborate. You can have an offering glass, a glass of water that you should change regularly, daily is best. If you have pictures of your dead, put them up and a candle. If you don't have pictures, that's okay too. Put things there that remind you of your dead. Um, it's a very individual practice. But start with an altar because an altar is an invitation. It is a welcome. It is, you are giving over that space to them. This is a physical symbol and a representation of the space that you are giving them in your spiritual life. And they'll respond to that. But most of all, be consistent. Be consistent in your engagement. Be consistent with what you do. I found that it matters less what you do than that you consistently try to do something. When you sit down to have your morning coffee, talk to your dead. Give them a cup of coffee too. Tell them about your day. Tell them what you're going to be doing. Talk to them. Your ancestors are the roots and the source of your strength and your luck and your power. They're in your corner. Your dead have a vested interest in wanting you to succeed. They want you to be successful and happy. They didn't sacrifice and struggle and suffer 
so that we could forget who we are and where we come from. We have been bought and paid for. So what they want is conscious engagement. Give them that. What about other small ways, um, for example, cooking recipes? Cooking is an excellent Telling stories. way. stories? Yeah, cooking is an excellent way um, to engage with your dead. Cook foods from where they came from. Cook foods that you know they liked and give them some of it. Um, tell stories about your dead. Ancestor veneration seeps into our culture. We just don't frame it in a sacred capacity. We visit graves on anniversaries. We tell stories about our dead. We name children after our dead. It just never occurs to most of us to broaden this and to expand upon this and to do it consciously. You know, um, in Catholicism, for instance, you ha you, people will have memorial masses said for their dead. But it's not something that you have to do once a year. You should be trying to do it every day. Don't be the relative that only calls when you need bail money, as a friend of mine put it. You know, make this a daily part of your practice. Whatever that means to you, if all you can do is talk to them quietly as you're having your breakfast, that's fine. Do that. But do something. And eventually you will, you, will, you will find that you are pushed in the direction of how this relationship needs to evolve. They will guide the relationship. You don't have to be a great medium to interact with your dad. You just have to be willing to do it. And they will take the lead in that process. You had an interesting phrase that you, you submitted ago. Putting your ancestral house in order. What does that mean? It means connecting properly to your ancestral lines and having rooted yourself deeply in consistent engagement. And that takes years. I am not joking when I say it took me at least a decade to get my ancestral house in order. It means that you have engaged with a number of your ancestors and you're all on the same page, so to speak. You have that re reciprocal relationship going. You, it's, it's become a natural part of your daily practice, of your spirituality, of the way that you view the world. And you've started to work out any kinks in your ancestral lines because we all inherit obligation from our dead just as we inherit blessings. Weird is something that connects the generations. So you started to find out where some of that is and you know maybe you know you need to pray for this particular ancestor and you're starting to deal with them as individuals and they have become a part of your family consciously and you're no longer at that awkward stage where it all feels weird. Okay. And it's normal for it to feel awkward at first. Beginning ancestor work, we've talked about engagement and well, we're, we're segueing into some of the brass tacks. Um, you've been doing it for a while. You mentioned that Ascent Terra is who taught you some of the things to do. I struggled with it. <laughs> I actually lived with a Santerian roommate for a while and I was struggling terribly in my own practice to try to get my ancestral house in order. And it just wasn't working. So one day I just up and knocked at his door and said, help, I know I need to do this. How do I do it? And he took me to his teacher who kind of got me sorted out and got me started. And I didn't realize what an impact that had had on the aesthetic structure of my ancestor altars until I was teaching a class at an interfaith seminary and I began by laying out an ancestor altar and there were maybe half a dozen people who had been raised in Cuban Centurion homes and they all came over and sat down with a deep sighs and one said it reminds me of home <laughs> and I was like oh I guess it did it leave its impact aesthetically um, for instance I'll begin with a white cloth and I'll have glasses of water out and I use Florida water which is a, a sweet smelling cologne that you can buy in many botanica to cleanse my space and, and, and the offering of tobacco and I just never thought about it. My ancestors were more than happy. I was like, hey, we're getting stuff. They were more than happy to have the tobacco and they liked these practices because it's, it, they, 
all those accoutrements teach you about respect and they teach you about consistency and, and they teach you how to give freely instead of avariciously, instead of automatically expecting, well, I'm going to give this because I want something. That's not the proper attitude to have. They're teaching you how to reconnect and re-engage with your family. And by family, I mean all the way back to the time the first amphibian crawled out of the primordial ooze and decided to try a little land living. You have ancestors all the way back. So I tell people that if you're having trouble with your recent generations of dead for one reason or another, go further back. Go as far back as you can. You don't need to know their name. They know you. That they're encoded. Your connection to your dead is encoded in your DNA. It's knit into the very physical fabric of who you are. Cemeteries are holy places and should be treated as such. I often find that as part of my ancestor work. Um, now keep in mind, as a shaman, I have greater obligations to our collective ancestors. For me specifically, I serve the military dead in, in particular ways. But I often find that just as part of my generic ancestor work, I'll go visit cemeteries. And I have five of them equidistant from my house. And I'll make communal offerings there. If, if I see tombstones where weeds have grown, I pick them. If I see offerings like little flags around Fourth of July or, or, or flowers at other times or whatever's laid out, if I see that these things have fallen over or become or come into disarray, I will go and I will write them. And I'll talk to whatever dead might be hanging around. Um, cemeteries are holy places. They're good places to visit, to begin to engage. Um, I find that one should never go empty-handed. So I will often bring baskets of offerings and I'll put them down in a central place and I will pray for the dead and I will talk to them and then I'll take a bag and I'll clean up any garbage that I find. You know, helping to keep cemeteries in good repair, that's good and sacred work. These are holy places, liminal places. The only other thing I really wanted to add there is that if you are going to make offerings outside and the offerings are going to be left, um, try to make sure they're biodegradable. Like I, I do leave cigarettes, but I snap off the filters and I throw the filters in my garbage bag. Um, if I leave, instead of leaving a pie in a tin pan, I'll, I'll leave turnovers instead. I mean, things like that. You want to make sure that what you leave is biodegradable because we also have an obligation to the land and God knows we as a people have done enough damage there. I think it's important that when we're making offerings we need to be respectful of where we are making them. So that's, that's the only other thing I, I really urge people to be mindful of.